Okay, uh, good afternoon. Welcome everybody. It's uh, one o'clock. I uh, uh, like to welcome you all uh, for this uh, next session at uh, from a paper. We have uh, an interesting uh, three quarters of an hour uh, to go about uh, the donut economy and the relation to sustainable ICT. So uh, we have uh, three people uh, to present. Uh, uh, first, we have uh, uh, first we have uh, Jennifer Duan of the Amsterdam Donut Coalition, and then secondly, we have uh, Wietse Kleisterle, uh, students from the Leidse University on uh, uh, ICT in business. Uh, doing research uh, in depth on uh, the model of donut economy uh, uh, and then targeted at sustainable ICT. And then uh, thirdly, we have uh, Ruud Priester, who was not in the program, but is added. Uh, he is uh, also from the Amsterdam Donut Economy and he will uh, uh, reflect on the presentation of Wietse and is also uh, available in answering questions. We have in this session also Tessa van der Horst, who will operate as a chat moderator. Uh, she is from RVO, and uh, so all questions you have or comments you can put in the chat. And later on in the session, we will uh, hear from Tessa the, the the most important questions to uh, to get the answers from Reert and and Wietse. Uh, my name is Frank Hartkamp. I'm from RVO as well. I'm one of the organizers of uh, Groene Paper. And maybe, uh, Wietse, you uh, uh, put on the next slides. So we have uh, 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 first some introductory about the uh, Groene Paper. It's uh, the second uh, year that we have an online uh, edition and uh, next year we hope to have more uh, physical contacts uh, as well in the in Groene paper. It's about uh, the sustainability uh, in uh, uh, in connection to uh, <coughs> to, to 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 the MBO, uh, HBO and, uh, and universities and uh, with regards to the transitions of energy climate, uh, food, and uh, materials, and the role of ICT in, in that. Uh, next uh, slide. We have uh, a number of organizations in the program committee, uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, this year Helicon will, is the host organization of the of the, the the plenary sessions on Friday, so you if you have not uh, subscribed yet for Friday or other sessions, please go to groenepaper.com and uh, you can subscribe, and then you get a link for other sessions uh, <coughs> today or tomorrow. Um, next uh, slide, please. Uh, this uh, session will be uh, recorded. Uh, so watch your language, please, and uh, uh, and it also will be uh, uh, <coughs> published uh, a few weeks after the finish of Groene Paper at groenepaper.com. So you can uh, look back this session or other sessions. Um, and if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat, and then Tessa will later on come back with questions to the presenters. So, uh, next slide, please. So, this uh, uh, webinar will be introduced firstly by Jennifer Drouin and later on by Wietse Kleisterle. And then uh, we come back uh, to you to answer questions. And we have a discussion for about 15 minutes, I guess. And then we will close the session. So, uh, Wietse, can you start with the presentation of Jennifer, please? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Duren, the community manager of the Amsterdam Donut Coalition. And in the next 10 minutes, I will share the journey of Amsterdam trying to become a donut city. I'm going to share my screen so you can see my slides. Let's see. 
All right, let's go. So what is the journey of the Amsterdam Donut Coalition? First of all, what is the donut economy? So if you look at the news, it can be quite daunting. You see headlines such as we have 12 years to limit climate change or 90% of world's children are breathing toxic air. So as you can see, we need a new narrative. We need a new goal. We need a new framework that fits this century. And this is where the donut economy comes in. Kay Brayworth has drawn the first global selfie in 2017, where she has mapped out the current shortfalls and overshoots as illustrated in this figure. And on the outer circle, we cross climate change, biodiversity loss, nitrogen loading and land conversion. And in the inner circle, we run short on all social indicators such as access to water, food, education, political voice, etc. So the donut economy is actually a visual framework for sustainable development shaped like a donut. It combines the concept of planetary boundaries and the concept of social boundaries. So if you imagine a donut in a hole in the middle, that's the place where people are falling short on life essentials. But people don't have access to food, they don't have access to health, education or housing. And every person in this world has a claim to have those essentials in life. So we want to get everybody out of the hole and into the donut itself. But at the same time, you need to respect the ecological ceiling. Um, you need to think of the ecological limits um, of the planet and the harm that we as humans need to avoid, such as climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, chemical pollution, land conversion, etc. So the dough in the middle is a sweet spot. It represents a thriving life, a safe and just space for humanity. And this is where you want to be. Kay Rayworth has also drawn um, principles for practice of the donut. For example, change the goal, see the big picture, nurture human nature, think in systems, be distributive, be regenerative, and be agnostic about, about growth. And you can read all about them in her book. And now coming to Amsterdam, as you know, I think you saw, you saw it in the Guardian article or in Times Magazine, um, Amsterdam has officially embraced the donut in their policy making. In April, 2020, um, Amsterdam has published as the first city in the world, the Amsterdam City Portrait. And it's actually a portrait that looks at four different lenses. Um, it uses four different questions to look at the city. It looks at the social, the ecological, the global, and the local. And with the city portrait, Amsterdam now knows where it's running short um, on the social indicators and where it's exceeding the planetary boundaries. And you can all look it up in the Amsterdam city portrait. So for example, if you look at housing, if Amsterdam is building new houses, it has to think of four different questions, four different lenses of the social. Does it contribute to more jobs and income? Does it contribute to community? Does it contribute to health or equality and diversity? But it also needs to think of the ecological. Does it contribute to biodiversity in Amsterdam? But you also need to think of the Global social, does it contribute to more jobs and health outside of Amsterdam? And when it comes to, to the global and ecological, does it cause climate change or air pollution? So it really shows that a donut economy is really holistic in its thinking. But what makes this city portrait really come into life is a city selfie. It's about the stories, projects, initiatives of the people of Amsterdam. And this is where the Amsterdam Donut Coalition comes in. We are a diverse group of people of about 450 people that all have the same goal. We all want to become a thriving city for people and nature. And we came together in December 2019, actually, just before the pandemic hit, and we co-created the why, the how, the what of the coalition. And we actually believe in the participatory theory of Jacob Nielsen, who says that in, in, in a community, in society, you always have a majority of people, 90% of people that lean back and wait for others to, to do something. And then you have 9% of people, the followers, that need a little push, um, they need a little boost. But then you have 1% of people, the minority of society, that do really want to make a change. And they are the creators. They are the people that that want to start today. And these are the people that you want to find. You want to find them within a triple helix. You want to find them within the government. You need to find them between corporates, knowledge institutions, communities, startups, networks, and NGOs. And if you find them, you can then connect them to a story, to an urgency. And that is the donut economy. 
And then you can really disrupt the system because you connect the people within different institutions, within the triple helix and different SMEs. But how did it all start in Amsterdam? Well, in 2013, Kate came to Amsterdam for the first time. She was invited by Marlin Sticker, famous researcher, to the picnic festival. Then in 2017, the book came out and one year later got translated into Dutch. And that's when the mainstream media picked up on it. Kate got invited to different festivals, to different events. She held keynote speeches. There was a documentary being made. And then in 2019, the bubble burst. There were so many different in initiatives in Amsterdam from donut days, donut workshops, donut deals, um, even the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences where I work Kay got um, uh, professor of practice, so she's trying to change the whole curriculum. So there were so many different things happening, but people didn't know each other. They were all working in silos. So what we thought is really important to do is work together, have one name, one platform to find all the different donor initiatives and actually get the city of Amsterdam into the donor on time. So what do we do as a coalition? We do three things. We connect and make visible what is happening in the city around the donut. We nurture international relations. We want to learn from different cities around the world and share our knowledge. And once a year, we want to organize a state of the donut event where we give everyone a stage and actually show how far have we come as a city and what needs to be done in the future. But we also know that to really encourage the systemic change, there are conditions in the city that need to be in place before. For example, shared narrative. Everyone needs to understand the donut economy and why it's important for them. How can you become a donut city if, the, if my neighbor doesn't understand the donut economy and what it is doing for her? And then you need also a dashboard. You need to be able to measure the social indicators and the ecological indicators and how they are interrelated. But you also need top level decision makers. You need knowledge and tools. You need organizations to jump on the train and you need policy and legislation change. So there are quite a few conditions that need to be in place beforehand. But we organize our community around themes because this is where it gets really practical. Um, and there are many communities around arts, cities and places, business and enterprise, education, research, government and policy. And here you can see a timeline. So in 2050, the city of Amsterdam needs to be fully circular, which means that we have um, not so much time left. And we as the Amsterdam Donor Coalition, we want to help as a commons. We want to be self-organizing. We want to do, we want to be peer-to-peer. -peer. We want to be super connected and just really give this movement a boost. And what has happened so far in practice well, first of all, we have a peer-to-peer -peer platform where everyone can upload their own projects, their own events, and connect and interchange and exchange knowledge. Like I said, Kay Rayworth is professor of practice at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, where curriculum is being changed and challenged, and where students really learn about the new economy and really become critical citizens. Then there are donor deals in different neighborhoods. It's an initiative by Anders Steichel, where social indicators are combined with ecological indicators in neighborhoods. Then there are donor places. And there's also new policies in the making where, for example, farmers that have a surplus of food distribute the food to poorer families within the region. And there's also global donor movement. Um, because Amsterdam has been in the media, there was so much requests from Berlin, but also from Rio de Janeiro um, and Copenhagen and other cities in the world. So they all have to have the same question, like, how do you start this movement? What is Amsterdam doing and how does it change and what is happening? So instead of facilitating every different city in the world, uh, once a month, we come together as the global donor community managers and we exchange knowledge and we help each other to really boost each other's movements in different cities. And we do this once a month and now it feels like a big family actually. And what are the challenges as the Amsterdam Donor Coalition? Well, first of all, there's so much happening. Um, and since we are the first city in the world that is officially embracing the donut in its policy making as well, we don't know where to start. Like, we don't know what exactly is needed to further accelerate this transition. Um, we are finding out, we're practicing, we're doing, um, that it's, it's a big experiment and it's a big learning and it's something that hasn't been done before. And also right now we're reaching the 1%, but what about the 99%? 
how can you make sure that it becomes an inclusive and diverse movement and that you include everyone um, in this movement? And also, how can you avoid that it's not just about circularity and the green bubble, you know, like the ecological indicators? How can you make sure that it's really a donor movement where it combines the social and the ecological, where it looks holistically and systemically? And lastly, some guiding principles that we really believe in is go where the energy is, practice first, theorize later, sketch a shared dream, connect what is already there, live by stories, build a peer-to-peer -peer platform, be open, be honest, focus on what goes right, make mistakes, trust the process, and also chat with deal. And if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me, send me an email, I'm happy to help out. Thank you so much for your attention. Bye. Well, thank you, uh, Jennifer. And uh, Witz, uh, I uh, think uh, you should uh, continue now. And if uh, anyone has any uh, questions uh, uh, on the first presentation, please uh, put it in the chat and we will come to that uh, later on. Uh, Witz. So, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wietse Kleistele, uh, and I welcome you uh, to a little room at Leiden University, um, from which I'll be doing this talk about how donut economics can be used to arrive at sustainable IT. So, as I already mentioned, uh, I've been invited to tell you all about how don donut economics can be used to arrive at that sustainable IT. And as luck has it, no luck at all, of course, um, I've been researching the application of donut economics on organizational sustainable IT uh, as a cooperation between the Rijksdienst for Ondernemend Nederland, or RVO, uh, and Leiden University for my master thesis for the past six months. And I'll tell you all a bit about donut economics, uh, my research, and the results of that research so far. Uh, before I dive in, though, uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank Jennifer for her explanation of the donut economics model, how the city of Amsterdam chose to apply this model, and how the Amsterdam Donut Coalition helped drive the application of the model. That was actually very enlightening. So, having said that, I quickly wanted to rehash what Jennifer has already explained about the global model. Uh, and add a few little details that are important for your understanding of my research. So, donut economic is a recent concept in economic science uh, with, a, with a holistic approach, um, which brings about the, um, a different way of uh, thinking, especially about economic principles at the global level. Um, one that moves away from measuring the success of a community um, on the basis of financial indicators such as GDP uh, and more on basis of uh, indicators that really determine uh, how a community is doing, such as social and environmental indicators. So, Donut Economics was thought up by Kate Rayworth, uh, who released her book Donut Economics, Seven Ways to Think Like a 21st Century Economist in 2017 and has since received a lot of praise, and Jennifer already uh, highlighted this as well. Now, the model is built around two elements, the social foundation and the ecological ceiling. Uh, and the thought behind this being that um, ecological theory can only provide useful answers to the global crisis if it is combined with social theory and vice versa. So, plainly put, we can only solve our planetary ecological crisis if we also acknowledge that we need to do so while allowing people, actually all people, to thrive. Now, divided between these two elements are 21 aspects that are analyzed. So, 12 social aspects and 9 ecological aspects. Um, and when measured and put together, uh, these aspects form a snapshot of our social and ecological sustainability, which is the basis for us as a species to do well or thrive. Um, so, that snapshot looks a little bit like this. Um, this is the first snapshot of how the planet is doing on their social and ecological responsibilities, um, as taken by Kate Rayworth. Uh, and it is not actually a very pretty picture, as in, 
it, it's aesthetically pleasing, but the uh, effect uh, that you can see is actually not that pleasing. Um, so as you can see, the social aspects are located in the center. Um, and uh, some examples of these are, these are uh, health, political voice, and housing. And the ecological aspects are on the outer ring. For example, um, climate change, nitrogen and phosphorus loading, or biodiversity loss. But the common denominator is that we're globally underperforming on our social responsibilities while overshooting the planet's ecological boundaries. So now how do we apply this model to organizational IT? Uh, as you can imagine, this global mechanism is up until now um, ill-suited when looking at smaller entities than nations or the planet in its entirety. This is actually not a criticism of the global model, uh, actually far from it. It does what it was intended to do and it does so extremely well. Uh, however, it was not initially intended to be implemented in an organization uh, um, without being subject to change. Meaning that for further implementation, we need to find out what this model means at the organizational, or in this case, the IT organizational level. And we call this downscaling. So how do we do this? How do we downscale? Uh, well, I've simplified and summarized exactly that to five steps, uh, which you can see uh, at the bottom here. Uh, and these will also form the structure for the rest of the presentation. So um, the first step is aspect conceptualization. And that entails the use of conceptualization theory to determine the underlying concepts of the 21 aspects of donut economics. And thereafter using these concepts to form a new definition on the smaller IT organizational level. The assessment mechanism uh, step entails finding and choosing a good way to measure and score the result. Um, because an organization can't improve if it doesn't know how and what it is doing. So uh, the next step is uh, identifying indicators and it entails uh, finding, altering or retrafting indicators uh, which suit the newly defined aspects. And these indi indicators don't have to be quantitative, they can also be qualitative. Um, the use of uh, indica indicators as requirements step is one where the indicators which we identified in the previous step uh, are formed uh, to fit the assessment mechanism. And the last step is expert verification. Uh, and this is where you consult with experts on sub areas of the theory and the entire overarching theory um, to see whether they agree with the steps that you've taken and the changes you've made. Uh, see whether it still fits within that same uh, model naming. And as you can see, it's an iterative process. Uh, which should also mean that the product will improve uh, the more iterations you make. So, now we're getting more to the practical side of the story. Um, so, I've downscaled the uh, donut economics model using the steps I mentioned on the previous slide um, to an IT organizational applied model that analyzes an IT department's sustainability. And this is where I actually dive into my research for a little. Um, and I can't illustrate every aspect of donut economics and explain how and why I changed it to fit the organizational uh, applied model, IT organizationally ap applied model, sorry, as I just don't have the time here. Um, but a good example of this change is when looking at the housing aspect. Um, which on the global level, the definition of the housing aspect is uh, decent, affordable, safe housing for all, as you can also see in the table at the bottom. Um, and uh, the indicator for analysis on the global model uh, on this aspect is proportion of global urban population living in slum housing. Now, on the organizational level, especially in the Netherlands, this is not a good indicator nor is the definition something that can be properly used because um, organizations pay uh, a wage 
um, that individuals are then able to buy or rent housing with, but are not further responsible or involved in personal housing. However, using the conceptualization theory, the underlying concepts were applied to an IT organizational setting. The result is a new definition in which we're not looking on the individual's uh, private housing, but at the housing for employees during their workday. So work or office space and whatever else is needed for the proper housing of employees during their work day. Um, this of course also means that a lot of the uh, changes um, have to be made to the requirement or requirements and indicators of this aspect. Um, now this method was applied to every aspect of donut economics. Uh, so I just gave you the example of housing, but as I said, there's 21 of these. Um, so this was done for every one of them, uh, where in which it was not completely obvious that everything could stay the same. Um, yes. So now we know uh, how to downscale uh, donut economics. Uh, the next question is, how do we categorize or assess organizations on their ecological and social sustainability using this donut economics? And um, to do just that, the uh, aspects that I just downscaled uh, were cast in the shape of a maturity model, at least in my research. Um, with five maturity levels to allow for uh, uh, assessment uh, of an organization's sustainability. Uh, and again, in my research, that's on a scale of one to five. Uh, at the bottom of the slide, uh, you can see uh, a schematic representation of how that looks. And I'll walk you through this really quickly before also showing a finished version. Um, so the five maturity levels, which you can see as the column headers, um, I wish my mouse would actually give an indicator so I could show you, but so um, the picture at the bottom shows you uh, the five maturity levels um, and uh, they are based, uh, they're column based uh, and they're based on you know, Kate Raworth's corporate to-do list. Um, and for clarification, that is higher categorization of how organizations res respond to donut economics. So uh, I feel I should uh, quickly explain that um, because, well, it's a bit unclear right now. Um, uh, Kate Raworth talked to a lot of organization about donut economics and actually a lot. Uh, and she got a lot of different responses that yeah, just ranged from uh, uninterested to extremely interested. Um, and she thought it would be a good idea to put all these responses together and see if she could find some kind of way of categorizing them. And she did. Uh, and in the end, these became the five categories I took as my organizational maturity level levels. So. In this maturity model, the further you go to the right, um, the higher the maturity level becomes and the higher the complexity, the amount of organization and reporting, outward thinking, circularity, uh, standard of accountability, and also the number of requirements becomes. So um, each of these maturity levels uh, have a set of requirements that are based on indicators that can be both quantitative or qualitative in nature. Uh, and these indicators are often identified using desk research. The requirements which uh, an organization has to meet in order to be classified to a, a maturity level uh, for uh, whatever aspect uh, are derived from the previously identified indicators. Depending on the assessment mechanisms, these indicators might still have to change or have a scaling slope or uh, yeah, whatever. It, it depends on the assessment mechanism that you picked at the very start. Um, yes. Mm, and I just lost a slide, it seems. Oh, well, uh, okay. 
two seconds. I'm going to see if I can find it. Okay, well, I can't seem to find it. Um, we will just continue here. So, um, after using uh, indicators as requirements, the concept model will be is actually done and can be verified to ascertain uh, whether it stays true to the original model and whether the one uh, the way of thinking, the numbers, etc., that you're using are correct. Uh, and as stated before, this is an iterative process, so you might have to repeat this a couple of times. Um, so since we've been using the housing aspect of donut economics uh, as, a, as an example, uh, this is a, uh, what completing those steps looks like for housing. So as stated, this is actually the set of requirements based on indicators uh, per maturity level of the housing aspect of donut economics in my IT model. Um, do note, however, that my thesis is mostly written for and aimed at the policy level and is not just about uh, the sustainability of IT, but also about how this IT sustainability is anchored in the rest of the organization. Uh, a table like this with different requirements per maturity level was made for each of the 21 aspects of donut economics. By determining an IT organization's maturity level on each of the 21 aspects of donut economics, a snapshot of the IT organization's social and ecological sustainability is made. And through the requirements of higher maturity levels, the organization can see what it needs to do in order to grow their sustainability. Now, my research focuses on making a snapshot of the sustainability of ID departments within the Netherlands. Um, to do that, uh, a self-assessment based on the downscaled version of donut economics was made in the form of a survey. That looks a little bit like this. Uh, so to continue our tradition of taking the example of housing, uh, I've shown the survey question about housing. Um, the survey looks pretty much the same as the table. Uh, the only real difference is that the maturity levels na level names have been removed and replaced with the letters A through E, as you see at the very top. Um, so this is done so that it could be made easily like multiple choice question. The question that is posed with these tables is, which situation describes your organization best? Uh, and this question is posed for each of the 21 aspects of donut economics. Now, this survey is actually still live and open to be filled in until the 30th of May. So if you have 15 minutes and want to contribute to sustainability and help me out, uh, fill in the survey or share it with your network. Uh, another thing I must say is that it is completely anonymous. Uh, you will receive the result of your individual survey after which the data, data will be aggregated to sketch an average picture of sustainability in the Netherlands in which no individual or organization names are used. Richie, maybe you can share it in the in the chat uh, uh, the when you are finished. Yeah, I'll do that when I'm finished. That's and great. And also, could you come to a conclusion uh, to, so we have some time for questions and uh, to introduce Ruth, uh, please. I have, I have two more slides and then I'll be done. Thank you. So, um, I've explained you all the broad strokes of how you can downscale a model to an IT organizational level. And I've shown you an example of how I did that with the housing aspect of donut economics. Um, the main reason I was invited, however, was to answer the question, how do we arrive at sustainable ICT using donut economics? And the final answer to that in my eyes is Downscale, downscale the model uh, per subset of the organization. Use that model within your organization to create insight in its sustainability, in which large scale adoption is preferred because this means that there's a, more data. And uh, um, yeah, if you generate more data, change will happen more quickly. Um, and the last 
uh, step is grow more mature within the model, uh, which means don't just measure it, actually do. So grow more mature. And this will also lead to turning policy into practice, um, which uh, leads me to my uh, next point, uh, which is uh, I've already downscaled donut economics to the IT organizational policy levels in its entirety. So I've done the first step for you. Uh, the second step I've also done for you uh, by creating a survey that creates insight into the IT organization sustainability. So fill out the survey, link is in the chat. I think uh, uh, Tessa just posted it uh, or actually on the previous slide. Um, now to attain that insight into your organization or in how, so into how your organization is performing. However, another step that will need to be made is making that more practical. So I see this model as the first step towards a broader framework or best practice, which operates at different, le different levels of the organization, uh, which I, by which I mean strategic, tactical, or operational, which incorporates other sustainability models like the CO2 letter, for example, uh, dependent on those levels. Um, so I'm currently heading for the last stage of my thesis. And after I've defended it, I will upload this to the Donut Economic Action Lab or DEAL in short. Uh, this is uh, where and when you can find and view my thesis if you are interested. Uh, and DEAL is the online platform set up by the creator of Donut Economics to further the cause uh, and exchange ideas. A lot of tools, graphics, and stories regarding Donut Economics uh, from all over the world are uploaded here. So, uh, actually, this is me signing off. Uh, if you found this an interesting subject, you want to find out more, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. And I'm sure Jennifer uh, is also open to be contacted or Lourdes. So, um, that was it for me. Thank you, uh, Witser, for your presentation. And uh, we heard a lot uh, in detail about uh, how to downscale uh, the donut economy model and to use it uh, for your own uh, organizational uh, purposes. Um, uh, Tessa, are there any questions in the chat uh, so far? No, there are no questions in the chat, but I have one myself, so I can ask it. Uh, it's for Ruud. Um, I was wondering, how can the audience contribute to the Amsterdam Donut Coalition? What can we do? And maybe, Ruth, you introduce yourself a little bit for you are kind of ambassador for the donut economy, uh, Amsterdam Donut Co Coalition, and you, uh, you have a profound uh, work in that. Uh, well, thank thank you, thank you, thank you all for for joining this session and the compliments to uh, to Wietse for his great work. Uh, so my name is Ruud Pisa. I'm the one of the founders of the Amsterdam Donut Coalition and advisor to Kate Rayworth's organization Donut Economic Action Lab, uh, responsible for the development of of its online platform and and collaborating in the development of of donut tools for all sorts of purposes. Um, uh, so, so uh, on your question, uh, Tessa, uh, it, it's very simple. It's it's an it's a very open Commons-like network, the Amsterdam Donut Coalition. So just go to AmsterdamDonutCoalition.nl. <laughs> I'll share it in the chat uh, and uh, make a little profile there there, and you will be informed on all sorts of events act activities. So you, it, it's it's really easy there to connect. Uh, to uh, to those specific themes that the coalition is working on. So so usually it's just uh, yeah see what what wh which team really uh, links to your field of interest and and uh, and and get in contact with the people. And if you don't if you happen not to find a way there, just connect Jen, who's the community manager, and she will connect you to to the right people. And, and the rest, uh, uh, is this only for people who are situated in the Amsterdam region uh, or in, no in practice it's not so 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 you see sort of a local a donut networks and coalitions popping up every almost everywhere and you see people sort of creating profiles at, at several places I mean we have this shared interest and it's really an, an organic 
self-organization oriented movement. So, so it's, it's open. Just feel free. If you, there, we, we find that there are many people who are are uh, yeah intrigued by this Amsterdam experiment, and then of course you're welcome in the in the in the community. And is it also uh, 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 possible to start your own donut uh, uh, city? Uh, yeah, definitely. City? So that's. Yeah, and, and, and Jen, who could not be here, who created this wonderful uh, short movie, she's, she's actually the expert and, and great international connector, but also a connector within the Netherlands. So we see now also within the Netherlands, quite some, some other cities and, uh, and, and regions, villages uh, that have shown the interest, shared, shared their interest in, in starting up. So, so again, it, it's just if you feel like that, that you uh, that it might be something for your village, city, region, neighborhood, whatever. Just connect her, and uh, uh, and she will guide you. And so so that so there's these parallel developments. So we are sort of a hotspot in Amsterdam, but there are many many more of over the basically over the world now. We're doing sessions in in uh, in in Melbourne, in Canada, in Oslo, in in Hamburg, and so the, so. And so uh, the, the Donut Economics Action Lab has been in the process of hiring a citizen region uh, lead person. And they're, they're now finalizing that process. So within a month, there will be something also orchestrating that on a global level. Uh, and until then, there's much demand and we'll improvise, but we haven't had any problem of sort of directing people to the right communities this far. So, so just, uh, yeah, go along with the energy, I would say. Uh, good, and then, then I have another question for you, uh, Riff. Um, <clears throat> uh, both uh, Jennifer and you are connected to the Hogeschool van Amsterdam. Yeah. Uh, is this coincidence, or is this an initiative also uh, related to uh, to education? Uh, uh, well, it is um, the. Uh, 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 Amsterdam, uh, the Amsterdam uh, University of Applied Science has uh, was not performing that well on sustainability in general a couple of years ago, and made a, made, made a great sort of expressed a great top down ambition to become one of the leaders to really take on the responsibility and become one of the leaders in sustainability higher education in the Netherlands and also with an international ambition, um, and so has been investing heavily. In that, I, I'm the program manager of of Reset, which is this problem, this program, already in its third year now. So there's we have really wonderful uh, progress uh, in the in the university uh, in a from a very integrated uh, strategy. Uh, and donut economics was an inspiration from that for that from the beginning on. So so because of this ambition expressed also top down and and the budgeting involved uh it, it was not very difficult to uh to convince kate rayward to become a professor of practice at, at our economics faculty where we've now set up this center of economic transformation which is really sort of boosting the transformation of uh, uh, economics uh, education throughout the faculty so it's, it's definitely part of a bigger, uh, bigger plan. Okay, thank you. So it has some uh, fundamentals uh, underneath. Certainly. I, is, yeah. is there, because there were three quarters, I would love to react a little bit on, uh, on Rietz's, uh presentation. Is there time for that? Yes, please. We, we just go uh, a little, a few minutes uh, longer than the session was because we have uh, so much to tell you. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Because um, so so I'm I'm really uh, uh, impressed and inspired by which is uh, sort of uh, uh, methodical approach to uh, uh, to localizing or downscaling the donut. Um, um, and I was also very intrigued and I had one, so I haven't seen the whole, uh, uh, works yet. Uh, um, but, um, so my question is there, the, the, 
the the whole uh, ambition of localizing the donut is something that you really sort of identified very cleverly because indeed that is the challenge of course yep. now we have had this experience in uh, in Amsterdam as was uh, shared in Jen's presentation which is uh, an approach developed by uh, um, a network of organizations in the context of a uh, thriving cities initiative which is a c40 uh, sort of global initiative which is also directed at localizing the donut and this sort of led to the conclusion of using the four lenses now i, I think this four lenses approach is 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 very inspiring because for instance i have some some background in the energy transition and i i know that the average person living within the amsterdam geographical boundaries uh, some 60% of your CO2 uh, output sort of is without is outside city, city boundaries, right? So, so it is it links to our uh, to to the vast production chains, of course, and our consumer behavior. Yeah. Uh, so, I, my, my main question is, how do you? Uh, so, so, to put it more precise, the the, the overshoots the. In general, you can say that Western countries like ours produce incredible overshoots on the ecological ceiling. Those are, uh, uh, and but the, those are uh, in effect outside of our borders, often on the other side of the world, due to these chain, production chains. Yeah. How how does your model sort of support? Um, uh, in in their definition of requirements, this sort of outside the local border borders affects. So um, the model actually um, says that you have to look at your networks, for example. So uh, a lot of this is actually not done by. Uh, so if you're looking at Amsterdam, for example, um, uh, a lot of of stuff is not made in in Amsterdam. It's made somewhere in China or Taiwan or uh, anywhere else. Um, so uh, a company in Amsterdam has partnered with this Chinese uh, organization to make something for them, and then people in Amsterdam sell it. Um, so what I say is, you as an organization are uh, responsible for the network that you have. That means customers, but also people that deliver stuff to you. Um, so um, you need to start looking at your network and see whether that still fits your ideas of how the world should be. And I think but, but that- the whole chain is involved, so it's- Sorry? The whole chain is involved. Yes, so the whole chain is, is uh, taken uh, into account with, uh, with my model. Okay. 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 Interesting. I think uh, we can we can elaborate on this uh, for many uh, time more. Oh yes. Uh, and I'm I'm very happy to have uh, the the donut economy as a, uh, as a model and uh, on groene paper this year. And maybe uh, it's a good idea to ask you back for next year to give an update on what's happened uh, since so many things are happening. Uh, and I would like to thank you uh, uh, both, uh, Ries uh, and, uh, and Ruud, uh, for your contributions uh, today. And I would like to thank the whole uh, audience uh, uh, today. And I would like to uh, uh, <coughs> to let you know the, the, that there are some more sessions uh, to come today and tomorrow. So please look at groenepaper.com. Uh, also, Tessa, uh, thank you for your uh, assistance at, uh, at the chat. And I would like to uh, to say goodbye to you all and uh, see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye.